uh, Thanksgiving break. Uh, I've reached that part of the semester where I say, oh my God, how am I going to get through all of this? <laughs> so much stuff that I want to share with you and I don't want to load up any new material <coughs> next week. So what I'm going to try to do this week is look at three sectors where the Gandhian experiments with truth uh, are working themselves out in the modern world. So this would be a little bit of a segue into Pax 164b for those of you who are taking it. And incidentally, uh, those courses have not been very heavily subscribed yet. So if you were thinking of taking 164b, might as well go ahead and sign up on Telebear so I know how many books to order and things like that. And the classroom is also not very large, so it's not nearly as large as this room. So you might want to sign up sooner rather than later. And um, Amy, did you have any copies of Black and White? Yeah, I didn't okay, have you passed them around. Good. So you put those posters up in your dorm room or subway or wherever you hang out. You think students might see it. Um, as far as the paper proposals are concerned, uh, most of them looked very good, as you know. <coughs> but from the conversations I've had with people since then, I would just like to <coughs> clarify a couple of things. These are not mm, – you're not publishing these in a scientific journal, although if it's a good paper, it may end up in Peace Power. As you know, from there, the world is our oyster. You know, it goes out all over the world. Um, so you don't have to say something that no one else has ever said. You know, I'm not going to like run to the library and say, oh, you know, Galton said this 40 years ago. That's not the point. The point is for you to be able to delve more deeply into nonviolence and some aspect of it that intrigued you but you were not able to follow up on. It may well be that your investigation will raise more questions than answers. That's perfectly okay. You want to say, it seems to me that from what I have said, the following questions would be important to <coughs> consider, but I, you know, we won't have time to do them here. That's absolutely fine. You should come to some conclusions somewhere. It's not like the whole paper should just be interrogation mark after interrogation mark. But it's not – if you want to like – for example, we were discussing someone who's comparing – or probably will not be comparing, but was thinking of comparing the Tibetan freedom struggle, the Indian freedom struggle, and saying that, okay, it differs from uh, what Gandhi did in India for the following reasons. Okay, given the slight differences in culture, we would expect these differences, so we'd put those aside, but we are left with some real differences in nonviolent conception, nonviolent commitment, nonviolent strategy. Then you go on to look at the fact that the Indian freedom struggle succeeded or, quote, worked as in work versus work. And the uh, Tibetan freedom struggle so far has not done. Now you have no way of proving that the differences from the Gandhian effort account for the differences in success. And I'm not expecting you to be able to prove that. But if you have a – if it's logical and you're trying to back it up with some historical evidence and you don't overreach the evidence that you've got. In other words, you don't say, this proves that Nagler was wrong or whatever it is that you're setting out to prove. But rather, this would lead to the impression that from the available evidence. That's fine. You, you, don't, have to, you don't have to go further than that. Okay. It's particularly important <coughs> this year for you to get the papers in on time, which is to say December 7th, the last class meeting, a week from Thursday, because of uh, my travel difficulties. I'm sorry about that. But it's usually a good idea to get papers in on time anyway. That's sort of a nonviolent thing to do. Um, so. What I'm going to try to look at this week is say some more about Gandhian economics and then I'm going to take one problem of domestic violence and one problem of interstate violence and see how the Gandhian legacy would apply to each of them. 
uh, material that I did touch upon in my book, so it's not like you wouldn't be absolutely unfamiliar with it. Um, but I also want to do one other thing each of the four days that we have left to meet, and that is you know that there's going to be a different kind of question in addition on the final. I mean, you know about IDs, you know about the DACE method for, for knocking IDs in Tax 164 courses, patented, proven success. You know about essays, but there's going to be another question in between those two where I'm going to give you a passage. It could be from something that you've read before. It may not be. It won't make much difference. The point will be to ask yourself, what are the assumptions that this writer is making? What does this writer know about nonviolence? What does he or she not know? And so each time that we meet, I'm going to try to give you a specimen passage to try uh, testing ourselves out on. And I realized this morning that I have the perfect passage for us to try because it's a good uh, connection between the violent stuff and the economic stuff. But it's not a written passage. It's a tape. It's an audio tape. And so I, I had to run down to Dwinell and get this boom box, which I hope among us we'll be able to figure out how to make it work. Um, the way this came about is I was in a little shop one time in Petaluma, which is a town where I was living, and they were playing the radio. And they played this advertisement for a product called ProTech. I hope, I hope they are no longer in existence. Otherwise, I'll certainly be sued for what we're going to do here today. But even that name should be a kind of tip-off. I mean, if you on, the, on the final I said, there's a company that sells burglar alarms and it's called ProTech, T-E-C-H. What's the assumption here? Even that is something you should be able to write a few intelligent sentences about. But I was listening to this ad and my jaw just hung open. I, I'd never heard anything so outrageous in my life, just like violated everything I believed in. Uh, so I said, what, what company is that? They told me. I wrote to the company and I said, gosh, I was really interested in your ad. I wanted to uh, share it with my students. So they sent me a cassette, little realizing that what, of course, I want to do is expose them <laughs> and do <laughs> counterculture. And what's it called? Uh, culture jamming. Yeah, we're going to do some serious culture jamming. So this <coughs> is just a, a very brief ad. Uh, we'll play it at least once. Uh, the acting in it is about on a par with most advertising acting, which is to say it's extremely corny, which in a way is very good because there's going to be no subtlety involved here. We don't want subtlety. Um, and if I, unless I have to rewind this, Listen to it. We'll play it again if you want to. And ask yourself what are the underlying assumptions behind this piece of hype or, I mean, text in this pitch. What are the underlying assumptions? Bearing in mind that when you have a message for someone, you communicate what you're saying, but you also communicate the underlying assumptions of what you're saying, possibly even more deeply. Okay, so let's see where we're at with this. You fully believe that what you just said, uh, you, you must think you're doing it as yourself. What? <laughs> uh, never know what? Never you to what? And at least that no, this guy is good. <laughs> Let's see. You discover what the explanation is. And uh, that is because we <laughs> Oops, sorry. Uh, well, I may just have to. Uh, do this ad for you. I've listened to it several times. I'm a better actor than they are, but uh, nope. Okay, I'm sorry. I thought I had a. Uh, I thought I had a recorder in my office, so I was going to listen to this this morning. I found out at the last minute that I don't have one. So let's see. <laughs> nope. It's just boring old me. Well, I think it's so much more fun <laughs> to listen to the tape 
than to hear me act it out for you. I'd have to do a female impersonation and <laughs> all those things. That let me try and fool around with it and see if it is actually on this thing. And if it is, we'll do it for you on Thursday. Okay. But uh, while we've got the word protec on the board, which itself is kind of a giveaway, what would you say about that? What is it trying to communicate? Yes, Philip. Yep. And and how are you going to protect yourself? Um, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it's fused into a single word that you should be afraid. You need to protect yourself, and you're going to do that by technology. And of course, the yeah, Joy. Well, if somebody comes up to you and says, how are you going to protect yourself, wouldn't you get afraid? I mean, that's – I mean, unless you're a really advanced meditator and you look at them and say, I don't have to be in your space. Um, yeah. You know, if somebody says, protect yourself, you know, you're going to be afraid. So even with – okay, even if we were to set aside the fear part, which is definitely a, a part of it, when you hear the tape, you'll be uh, – you'll definitely understand that, assuming that – the message that I want is actually on this tape. If not, I will have to act it out for you. Um, you'll see that they're definitely playing on fears and they're definitely playing on the idea that the way to protect yourself from danger is technology. And that's very good for the economy, very bad for reality and everything else. I have a, a quotation from a magazine called Guns and Ammo, <laughs> which is a uh, NRA – Front magazine, in which uh, this person says there is a profound sense of security felt by 35 million Americans knowing that they have in their home a gun. And yet the statistics are that you're 35 times more likely to either have your gun stolen or shoot somebody in your family by mistake than to defend yourself from an intruder with a gun in your home. So really out of sync with reality. <coughs> okay, let me do something now which is share with you a conflict model that I was going to save until next week but I think might, you might find it useful in your paper writing. So I'm going to do that right now and then we'll get back into the economics thing. Okay. This will be a comparison and a contrast between – the people, as you can see, this is really going to be brilliant, uh, between people who are in the dominant paradigm and people like us uh, who are part of the cutting edge. And where do we differ? Well, interestingly enough, with regard to conflict, it, we used to think that us nonviolent people are against conflict and try to get rid of it, whereas dominant paradigm people like the people who came up with the United States policy that was on the headlines today that since Iran and Syria are very important countries for us to talk to, we will not talk with them. So people who have that paradigm, and you can maybe explain to me what the logic of it is, they – always increase conflict, which this will certainly do because ruling out conversation leaves only one remaining way to adjust power differences and desires and that is by fighting. So they're making conflict inevitable whereas we try not to have conflict. But especially in the area of conflict resolution, we came to understand that actually without conflict, you do not adjudicate differences and you do not have a way of resolving injustices very often. So really, we, new paradigm people, whatever we want to call ourselves, some very honorific <coughs> term without getting into triumphalism, but some honorific term, we agree with the dominant paradigm folks that conflict is inevitable. It's a part of life and we're not going to set out to change that because that would be quixotic. It's impossible. There's always going to be conflict. 
But there the similarity ends and we start splitting off into very, very different domains. They th we think that conflict is inevitable because of diversity, right? Pe no two people are alike and that means that even their viewpoints will differ in some ways. And they've been, you know, just studying identical twins who were separated at birth and they have remarkable convergences that you never would have predicted like here are two twins who never even knew that they had a twin. They discover one another when they're 25 years old and it turns out that they both work for the same telephone company and they both married a woman named Joan. But even <laughs> identical twins who have grown up together will have certain differences in viewpoint about stuff. Whereas the dominant paradigm folks who are in charge of our foreign policy right now think that conflict is inevitable because of separateness. That, that is to say there are existential differences among people by which I mean in order for one person to succeed, another person probably has to fail. And you go to a further point and say the success of one person will be measured by the failure of another person. There's even this horrible paragraph which I would not give you on the, mid on the final from Göring, I think, the Nazi leader who was saying you look out there and you see a hundred people lying dead or you see a thousand people lying dead or five thousand lying dead and you know that you really have got your work done. So you really measure you is – ultimately, if you follow this logic, you go down this slope, you end up in a place where another person's uh, misfortune is your fortune. But at least there's this initial stage where in order for you to thrive, the other person may have to suffer. So our whole concept of what conflict is all about and what we want to do with it is – becomes radically different at this point. We feel – and I just came up with this this morning as you probably <laughs> are aware, so I need to check my notes. Uh, we feel that the way to treat conflict is through mutual learning. That is, this diversity includes a certain amount of misperception and it's from that misperception that differences in outlook start leading toward conflict and possibly toward dispute. So before it gets to dispute where I am against you, we think that this misperception can be cleaned up, cleared up by <coughs> educating the other person, persons. Not necessarily educating them in an academic sense, which is the first stage of the escalation curve. But opening their eyes to something which they're at this point not willing to see, which involves us in the law of suffering, which is the second phase. But in both cases, it it's a kind of enlightenment of the understanding that leads to the clearing up of the conflict. And the ultimate result that we're aiming at is unity, reconciliation and unity. And we see this as – Part of the purpose in life. There's this marvelous surah from the Quran which says, Insan, O human beings, I made you into different tribes, countries and individuals, not that you, could, you should despise each other but that so you could rediscover each other. You could find each other, could, f could find a unity. Now you might ask yourself, why did Allah go to the trouble of dividing us up in the first place just so that we could get re back together again? That uh, <coughs> Nobody has ever been able to explain this. Okay? It's called lila in Sanskrit which means a game or a joke of some kind. And Dante, as I mentioned last time, calls it the divine comedy. It's just a situation we have to accept. The world is a world of diversity and we have to sort that diversity out. We have to keep it in its appropriate level without letting it obscure the unity. So we have to use the diversity and go towards unity and create a unity and diversity type of world order, world order based on unity and diversity. And this would naturally tend to be from the bottom up. 
Um, I can't at this moment remember whether I actually shared this model with you or not. I probably did when we were going around the wheel of nonviolence. But Gandhi has this world order model which is not a pyramidal one but a circle. And the way it works is the individual – you start with the individual. Yeah, we did go over this. The individual serves the family. The family serves the village. The village, village serves the district on up to the entire planet. The way things are going, we may have to include the solar system, other galaxies, so forth. The same principle would apply except there are, are fewer planets right now thanks to an act of the Science Federation. But this is the way it goes. Uh, we, we both consider conflict as inevitable. We say it's because of the diversity of perceptions and because of a certain amount of unclarity of understanding, which is, seems to be the human condition. We're supposed to use conflicts to clear up those misunderstandings and get to a unity that embraces everybody and preserves their diversity. That's our model. Now the model that we are now suffering under is very different. The, the strategy is not mutual learning but domination. And I don't think I'm just stereotyping this. I think this is what it is. After all, the national security document of the United States right now states that our – the country's policy is it's full spectrum dominance. Uh, we're the number one superpower. We should dominate everybody. And not that this is going to lead to perpetual suffering in their mind, though inevitably it does. And George Kennan said, I can promise you this. This world will never be governed from one single power center. It never has been and it never will be. Alexander the Great failed not because he didn't have the internet and interballistic missiles. You know, it's just this human nature will not let you go there. So, but what they think they would like to uh, reach is a kind of hierarchy following the natural process of competition where the weakest fall to the bottom and that's where they belong and the strongest rise to the top and that's where they belong. So as I say, uh, I'm going to add something to this uh, on – Thursday or next Tuesday, which will, I think, bring it even further into focus for you using in your papers. But for right now, I think that may help start sorting us out. Anybody want to comment on this? Add something? Because you know this is brand new with me. There may be parts I'd be happy to add or subtract. Or you think it works, doesn't work? You know the old – Roman expression, qui tacit consentit, if you don't have any objection, I'm going to assume that this is a valid model. I haven't decided yet whether it'll – yes, Shannon? Well, let's put it this way. Y you and I believe that that will never work. <laughs> All you can do along those lines is lurch from crisis to crisis. You can never arrive at stable peace. So it aims at hierarchy, but because hierarchy is inherently a lie, if you will, it is not true that one human being is worth more than another human being. The hierarchy is always going to lead to more and more exploitation, paradoxes of repression, and it will always fall apart. And if you just – I have to say, blindly and stupidly go back into it. Say, okay, it didn't work in Vietnam, but that's because we didn't do it hard enough. Now we have a real man and it will work in Iraq. You just keep on going over and over with this. It, it will never lead to a stable situation. And the further you go in time, the more drastic the deteriorations are because people are <coughs> in the long run very slowly learning. Is Rami? Mm -hmm. Say on like abortion or some, right. some issue where mutual learning is, is kind of like – it doesn't seem yeah. possible. Well, you, you pick the issue of abortion, which is probably one of the naughtiest uh, and we should think about that. I have 
uh, a good friend in Washington, D.C., who runs an organization called the Search for Common Ground. And what they do is they take people who have radically different beliefs, just like you were saying, Rami, and they sit them down and say, okay, you believe this, the person believes anti this, but what do you have in common? And see, what happens is when we think about the difference, we go off into the world of difference and we forget that we could have anything in common. We don't search for it and it becomes impossible to proceed. We just – from there we just degenerate into a fight. But uh, it, it turns out that even in these two very polar cases, both groups, pro-abortion and anti-abortion, they both believe in the value of life. Uh, one group says that you become sacred, let's say, after the first trimester of gestation. And from that first trimester until birth, life is sacred. After that, you know, you can join the army, <laughs> the gang war, we can execute you, all of that stuff. Life isn't sacred. I'm making fun of this belief system. But, but there is an actual underlying belief. Now, you and I – okay. Now, those of us who are pro-choice, why are we pro-choice? Because we think human life makes sense. And therefore, consciousness and reason are of value and people are not like ants. You know, they're not just supposed to be put in a place in somebody else's hierarchy. Everybody should have choice. So the difficulty really is that the people who are against abortion, it's, they're not doing it 100 percent because of their belief in the sanctity of life. Part of it is because they're scared stiff and they want the state to control people. So once we clear that up and we say we're going to fix abortion – let's say here you could – this could be a whole Tax 164A paper right here. We're going to fix abortion by educating people into not only safe sexual practices but into other modes of fulfillment and we're going to reduce abortion much more than you will by bombing clinics and we can prove it. Here are the facts. This is assuming that at the moment you've got them rational and they're listening to you. And we're actually going to enhance the sanctity of life by not having the state tell a woman what she can or cannot do with her pregnancy. So underneath that difference – what I'm getting at, I guess, Rami, is it's not really an underlying difference in value. It's a difference in strategy, which you mistake for a difference in value. Everything gets polarized and then you can't see the other party. So what I just stepped you through is very similar to what the Search for Common Ground does with people. It's like, hang on one sec. Uh, yeah. When I was invited – I don't know why I didn't get around to wangling another invitation this semester because I have so much fun doing this. But I got myself invited to the uh, national security class in the Air Force Military Affairs Program. And uh, I walked into that class. It's a nice group, not as big as this group. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, there's about a third of them were in fatigues. and. Uh, they were looking at me and, you know, coming from my standpoint, I have to come from, okay, what do we have in common? Which is not immediately apparent. And I said, you know, what we have in common is we both want the United States to be secure. I said, I promise you, I am a deeply patriotic person. I, you know, I didn't – except in the karmic sense, I didn't choose to be born in Brooklyn. <laughs> New York, you know, it could have been anywhere. But uh, now that I'm born here, <laughs> this is my country and I feel for it as much as you do and I want it to be secure. That's why I, I like starting off with that first panel we have in common. But your image of security, your definition of security is very different from mine. Mine is an image of what is called common security. Yours is separate security. So – but I think it's very important to be able to start with that thing that we have in common, which I think I'm going to hypothesize 
that the more you differ from another group, the deeper the commonality will lie. So I'm, I guess what I'm proposing is that we should always be able to discover that. Uh, incidentally, St. Augustine said the same thing in Book 21 of uh, City of God where he says, you, we have people running around fighting wars all the time, but what they want is peace. They think when they conquer the other person and get them to do their will, peace will supervene and they've got what they want. So what they want and what we want is the same. It's just that their definition of it is a little bit, uh, what should we say, <laughs> hopeless. So it becomes, to be sure, in a deep way, not just cognitive, but it becomes an educational task. Yeah? Um, can you talk about separateness a little bit? Yeah. Like othering or what I just, I'm not confused. Yeah, the way I use the term separateness, it, it sort of uh, accepts the surface of the universe as real. It's, you know, you're probably too old to remember, but in the early days of computers, they had a, a, a concept called WYSIWYG, which stands for what you see is what you get. In other words, you see something on the screen. When you hit the control P, it will print out like what you're looking at. Well, I borrowed that term and I, what I say is that there are some people who think it's a WYSIWYG universe that because you look around this room and there are 65 separate individuals here, we think that's it. That's it. You know, 65 separate individuals. But the new paradigm, looking for a better word for it, but the nonviolent vision is that we're not denying that there is a level of separateness, but it is relatively superficial compared to an underlying unity. Now how deep that underlying unity is, that may differ among people of good faith. You may say, we're intensely interconnected so that if I pollute the atmosphere uh, or let's say you live in a third world country and I sell you some polluting poisonous product, and I think, ha ha, I got rid of it, that works its way into the ecosystem and comes right back to me. So you may go that far or you may say with the wisdom tradition that we really are one in some way that does not appear in the macroscopic world. And even, even s real science would have a hard time disagreeing with you. So the different depths of that, but what I'm calling separateness is, to, is this position that because we look separate from one another, we actually are, that's all there is to it. So it's perfectly reasonable that if you suffer, I, I either wouldn't care or I might even be happy. There are no mirror neurons in this world. Does that clear that up? Yeah. Misa? What is the underlying cause of the conflict? This is a r actually a very good example. What if the underlying conflict is a loss of human dignity? Well, remember what led uh, Richard Attenborough to launch his mighty project which 25 years and $25 million later became the Gandhi movie. It was one statement that he read in Gandhi where Gandhi said, I have never understood how a human being can believe that through diminishing another person he enhances his own dignity. Because that's part of separateness. I, in separateness, and the, the more we talk about it, the less I like it. In separateness, I would actually believe that I could embarrass or humiliate, let's say, Alex or Amy, and I would benefit from this. But that's only seeing things, you know, it's like, like looking at life from the very, very top, not seeing that underneath, if I humiliate another person, I have humiliated humanity in which I participate. Not to mention the fact that if I humiliate another person, I have created a really serious breach of unity between us and I suffer from that on a level that I may not be aware of. So again, it just becomes a question of awareness. What the nonviolent person will do is bleed in front of the person who's doing that 
in such a way that they have to see that they are hurting themselves by hurting you. And that's where this new science, and incidentally there's a, a new term for this. Oh, good, Ilan, I'll be able to see you better from here. There's a new term for this that I wasn't aware of when we first went over the, uh, the uh, MRI studies and all that, and that's positive psychology. I think that's a very good term. It means everything from Freud to Maslow was negative psychology. We look at neurotics and drowning rats and things like that. We derive principles of human psychology from that. But they're now looking at these <coughs> bonds of association among us. So I would say that on if the criterion is not, a, say, a material kind of a diminishment but dignity, that's going to be the major, the, the, the most important criterion from the nonviolent perspective. Yeah. So when you elevate the dignity of another person, you have elevated your own. And, uh, then Martin, we can go a step further. Martin Luther King had this amazing – statement about how we need the diversity in its place. And I, I'm sure you know the statement I'm thinking of where he said, I cannot be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And you cannot be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. So this whole idea that by impeding the fulfillment of another person you enhance your own totally does not work. Any other this, – this, is, this was helpful. Any other comments? Yeah. All right. Good. Well, this uh, – if you allow me now, I'll just jump back into the economy part instead of gracefully segging into it through the ProTech ad, um, which you'll hear about next time. But I gave you what I think are the absolute core principles of Gandhian economics last time. Those were, yes, first of all, that the nonviolent economy will be needs based and the present economic systems of most of the world, the developed systems, are wants based. And right away, we think they've gotten into a terrific problem. I'm going to I have a quote that I, I think I remember it closely enough to use it. It's from a tremendous uh, figure, probably the greatest woman mystic certainly of uh, modern India. Her name was Anandamai Ma, illiterate Bengali woman. But she said one time, man, meaning human being, seems to be the embodiment of wants. <coughs> Want is what he thinks about. And want is what he gets. Be, become aware of your true nature or else there will be wrong wanting, despair, desolation, and death. It's really a, a really good quote, so I'll bring in the exact wording next time. But the point that I'm getting at is this. Um, wants, when they're not connected with real needs, actually lead – cannot lead to fulfillment. And because they can't lead to fulfillment, they get into what Freud called a repetition compulsion where you say, oh, if that was the wrong flavor of ice cream, let me try another one. You know, when Dolly Madison invented ice cream in 1926, all it was was ice cream. And she thought that was terrific because, you know, the world was the world before ice cream and the world after ice cream. People liked ice cream a lot, but then they said, just plain ice cream? Let's add a little chocolate to this or a little cherry. And now, as you know, the last count, there's 128 flavors and going. Because you know, it's easy for me to say this. I know this is un unfair. It's easy for me to say this because I don't eat ice cream. But <laughs> the fact is I do not believe that a human being can be fulfilled by ice cream. If he or she could we would, or little one could, we would have been fulfilled a long time ago. But this, you can see what happens when you start arousing wants. 
and are not directly connected with real needs. They just proliferate and that has gotten us into this economic disaster that we're in right now. Now, John? Okay. Yeah, this is a very important question. Let's say we believe all this and <laughs> actually think Gandhi was right and we start living in accordance with it. You're going to be 180 degrees from everybody else around you. Uh, this is no easy question. Uh, I think the only way to resolve it is – by looking upon those differences as diversity, misperception, and not dividers. So uh, you have to be able to stand there and know that what a person is doing is hurting himself and hurting other people and not get hysterical about it. You know, try to do the best you can to show them that they're going the wrong way, period. End of quote. No being attached to the results. Otherwise, you drive yourself crazy very, very quickly with this stuff. But uh, you also have to be secure enough in your own beliefs that they don't threaten you. Uh, in my experience, people influence one another very strongly on this dimension and on this level of wants. And if they say to you, in effect, here, smoke this funny little cigarette and you'll be happy. And you say to them, okay, get thee behind me. You know, I'm going to report you to the narco police. You know, you're, this is against Islam or <laughs> any of these things. That will not work. You know, you completely cut off the conversation. But if you say to them, I'm happy already, they <laughs> will look twice at you. It will sink in. It's probably the best you can do for that person. It's, th this is a very real issue and I think it impedes us very often from experimenting with these principles because we say, oh my God, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to look pretty weird. And you, there used to be, I don't know if she's still around, I haven't seen her recently. This woman, Julia Winograd, used to hang out in Berkeley. She's always dressed in black from top to toe and it wasn't fashionable then, by the way. This so she really, really looked strange. And she always carried a little bubble pipe and she was just blowing bubbles and walking around dressed in black and, and selling poetry. And so somebody from, I don't know, the Daily Cal came up to her and said, now why do you uh, dress in black and blow bubbles and go around selling your poetry? And she said, you think it's easy being weird in Berkeley? <laughs> you know, you have to really, really work at it. <laughs> but. <laughs> But the fact is, uh, if you start moving along these lines, in some ways, you know, they'll say, oh, just say he's green, you know, she's a vegan. You know, I have a lot of, some of my best friends are vegan. It's not a problem. Uh, but when you really start getting to some of the deep lying things, you are going to look very different. And I think at that point, we get a little scared. So I think it's safer to trust your own experiences and feed them back and see what's happening to you than it is to look to the people around you for guidance. That's a serious <coughs> question. Okay. Uh, where were we? So I'm up to this – I'm starting with this needs, wants business because that's where Gandhi started already in 1909 when he wrote Hind Swaraj. He said, the time is coming and it won't be very long when we will look at this mad pursuit of multiplying our wants and say, what have we done? We have gotten ourselves into an incredible mess. It's not going to be easy to recover. Um, the other principle that I highlighted I – I think I'm going to be forgetting one, so help me out here – is Swadeshi, whereas the wants economies just naturally tend towards centralization and globalism and globalization. And we'll talk more about those next semester. Okay, but I think you get the general idea. Power and wealth tend to be sucked up. You remember that 
set of slides that I showed you that the wealthiest people are going up way past Everest and the rest of us are lying face down on the 50-yard line somewhere. Uh, Julia? Okay. It's it's hard to distinguish like needs from wants with with the tools of society or tools for service in society. Like, mm -hmm. how do you really distinguish like the needs and the wants? Well, to distinguish between needs and wants, that's why I gave you that three-tiered breakdown last time. That we have, you know, pre-Maslow needs for food, clothing, and shelter, and they're qualitatively different from the next tier, which is the needs to fulfill ourselves in terms of the service we can perform for society and then the top tier just being for show, for comfort and stuff like that. So that's a rough and ready way of distinguishing. Oh, but if for the tools, just the need to I never said that any of this is going to be easy for you. I mean, it's very difficult to distinguish between needs and wants, and it's uh, it's easy to fool yourself. Um, yeah. How do I do it? I was just thinking about that. I, I, the fact is, I don't do it very well, so that's why I didn't launch into an explanation. But um, it's kind of complicated. But uh, let's say I have been sucked into an ad for a new electronic device. I mean, outside of lattes, this is probably my biggest difficulty that I'm struggling with is a faster CPU or a lighter laptop or a, a snazzier <laughs> beard trimmer or something like that. <laughs> I, <laughs> some of you don't need to worry about this for one reason or another. Um, uh, there's no question that when I'm looking at those catalogs, be they online or in a slick piece of magazine in front of me or a shop window. There's no question that there's a part of me that's about eight years old that's jumping up and down and saying, oh goody, you know, I can afford one of these and won't I have fun uh, buying one. And so what I do is I try not to do a whole lot of impulse buying. If I did, I'd be very poor and my office would be packed with Dell computers from floor to ceiling. Um, but at the same time, I mean, maybe this is a weakness, but I think I need a certain amount of fun also. It even says in the Bhagavad Gita, you should have entertainment. So I'm not going to spend like $5,000 for some entertainment. But if I spend $1,000 on something that I can use and will actually make my work faster, I don't begrudge myself getting some entertainment out of it. So that's my life path. Yeah. Um, uh, Dan? It won't hurt you any yeah, to do a lot of reading. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the rules he's, uh, not the rules, but one of the things Gandhi seems to focus on is, you know, not having anything that makes your job easier or not, or not that, or just it, it takes, it takes, I guess, for example, like a cell phone kind of breaks, I feel breaks, might break down the, uh -huh. not going up to a person and talking to them. Yep. However, and also, and so if you get <laughs> Yes, I agree with you. Okay. So <laughs> it would be, but I, it seems like there's so many ways in which. Yes. Just, okay, now then let's get rid of cell phones. But it seems like that would just affect so many other things like yeah. the manufacturers of cell phones. Yeah. That's, the, that's how they gain fulfillment. And that's also how. Uh, <laughs> I would but hesitate. Also, you're, all, you're also taking away those jobs from those people yeah. who are making. So okay. in our society now where everything's linked into one another, it seems like getting rid of one thing just causes a whole bunch of problems for everything else. This is correct. And that's why – and thank you for reminding me – we had this other principle of trusteeship and non-possession instead of ownership. In other words, we don't have to, quote, get rid of cell phones. We have to get rid of the sense that by making – Eight billion dollars selling the razor phone, <laughs> Motorola was fulfilled. So now they're going. I happen to know this. They're going around sucking up every high tech company that they can purchase. 
That's not what I'm calling fulfillment. That would be a wrong use of the needs <coughs> hierarchy. So That's just profit. It just seems like okay. – <laughs> Hang on. Let me, let me finish. Yeah. But there's no question that we have to transition somehow. Well, under a capitalist or a communist regime, we're going to yank those possessions away from some people, which won't help them psychologically and may well lead to them fighting back. So what we do is try to educate their attitude towards the thing that they're a trustee. Then they can back out of it in a reasonable way. It's not that there won't be any pain, but it won't be cataclysmic. It, it seems that <coughs> our economic system is fine if everyone's values are, are at the same like our – I don't think our economic system is fine in, in the sense that I don't think it's uh, sustainable to use the prevailing word. I mean, when I was an undergraduate student in NYU, New York University, the registrar made a mistake and it looked as if I had to take an economics course. <laughs> so <laughs> I, s I protested, but I don't know math. But I live in Greenwich Village. I'm, I'm a folk singer. I don't know anything about money. They wouldn't listen. I had to take an economics course. So I went into this class and uh, – I, I was learning some stuff. The instructor was young. He was uh, interesting. But I began to feel that something was terribly wrong. Like either these people were crazy or I was crazy. <laughs> and I preferred to believe at that time that they were the problem. Because what they were saying is that all economies will be fine as long as they constantly expand. And even back when I was an undergraduate student, I, I mean, I wasn't very smart, but I knew this was a finite planet. You know, the, the universe was not pumping 100 million gallons of crude oil un under, the, under the surface of the earth every day. So I don't think that the prevailing economy is going to work. And in fact, uh, if you read The Great Turning by David Corten, you'll see that it's coming up against a really big brick wall really fast. I mean, I know this is going to sound funny, but – What's all right? I sound funny all the time. People who believe that Star Wars is possible or something like that in the, in the, in the future where uh -huh. the expansion takes place. I mean, yeah. if the universe is infinite, then we can continue to just expand out, outwards into it. Okay. Or, or we're going to have to completely yeah. give that up. And but even that. there, you have, you, have, you, you have to realize that those people have to be made to realize uh, – I, I see you, Drew. I'll get to in a second. And the more they suffer, the easier it is to tell them why they're suffering. You have to realize that they're not getting any happier. They're just getting more and more insecure all the time. And so there's been this whole shift just as – and I'm glad we're talking about this – but just as we talked about different human needs assessments and having to do with a different concept of human nature, similarly in economics, people are starting to step away from the gross national product as a measure of anything but the gross national product. So we've been assuming that the bigger your gross national product was, the happier you were. <coughs> and so there's a new triple bottom line idea, you know, human well-being, preserving the, the support system of the planet and material well-being and profit. And then there's uh, the kingdom of Nepal where the king of Nepal has decided that he's not going to measure the gross national product anymore. The IMF can do that if they want to. But he's going to go around and ask people, are they happy? Whoa, what a concept. So it takes a really small Himalayan kingdom to do this. So he has his people go out and say, you know, have you been divorced recently? Any suicides in your family? So far, are you okay with what you're getting? And they've also done this in smaller studies in the U.S. And they've shown that a certain period of time where the economic product of the United States doubled, happiness index was absolutely flat. In fact, it bears out what we were saying about the three tiers of human needs because once you have satisfied the needs and you're launching up into the wants, you know, that Greek concept of pleonexia, you are launching into make-believe. You are – you are fooling yourself that you're going to be made happy by those things. 
Now, given powerful media hitting you with a 3,000 message per day barrage, you can really be made to believe that. But I have to say I don't think that that belief is very deep. Just as I don't think the people who believe that they feel more, sec they feel more secure because they have a gun in their house, I don't think that's a very deep feeling of security. And you remember that story that I told you about Jeanette Rankin that she goes down south and one night she locks the door of her house and that night she can't sleep. She's so insecure. But, so, but it still seems like you're not really changing the economic system. You're just changing the thoughts of the people. Just the changing the thoughts of the people is <laughs> everything there. No, no, I understand that, but it has nothing to do with capitalism or anything. Hey, I have no problem with capitalism. Believe it or not, there, I've said it and I'm glad, <laughs> right? <laughs> right here in Berkeley. I have no problem. I don't care whether you have capitalism, communism, whatever, as long as you have trusteeship and you're not a materialist. Yeah, but you, yeah, and that just seems to be what his principle is getting to. That's what his principle is getting to, right. Not, yeah, okay. I wouldn't say <laughs> that, okay, uh, having – I made my extreme statement and you made your extreme statement. I'm going to back away from mine a little bit. I don't think it has nothing to do with the economic system because given human nature, if you present human beings with certain objects, they will respond in a certain way. There's a, a study that's just been published. It's in a magazine called Psychological Science where they took uh, – I guess they, they took college students. They always take college students <laughs> because they'll do anything for three bucks an hour, I guess. <laughs> and it was men. So it's already kind of a problem. And they tested their testosterone levels and then they divided them into two groups. And one group was given toy guns to play with, which they enjoyed immensely, I'm sure. And another group was given some kind of children's game, which was uh, innocuous. And then they were tested again to see, A, did anything happen to their testosterone level and B, would they be more aggressive? No surprise here, folks. Testosterone level rose upon playing with a little plastic gun and they got more aggressive <coughs> in certain ways. So that means there's a limit to how much I can hold my extreme statement that the system doesn't matter at all. But it's rather it's the case that a kind of natural system will come out of a non-materialist needs-based system. And an, another kind of system will grow out of a materialist wants-based system. But the fact is that um, there's really nothing inherently wrong with capitalism if by that you mean that some people accumulate material resources and are able to do things with them. It's what kind of things do they want to do. That's our problem. Yeah, it's just what you choose to do. What you choose to do then. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you just choose not to – I'm not going to choose to exploit anybody. I yeah. just want to become rich. I mean, which almost makes it frustrating because it's, it, it just doesn't it, – it just shows that you don't have to flip the whole – the way the world works. It just, it just seems yeah. like everybody has to just take this class. Or yeah, everyone has <laughs> to take this class. That's what I've been saying all along. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> this is not an easy change to make. Uh, but – I'm saying, I guess, that A, it's not harder than a revolution where you take all the money away from the rich people yeah. and it leads to a permanent but fix. It's a, it's a change that requires no resources. No material resources, basically, yeah. right. Give me an iPod and I'll get the message out and we can, we can do it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Joy and then Sid. For which economic system? For our economic system. You're, no, I agree with you. Um, you know, what you showed us about that yeah. vast disparity between yeah. rich and poor. And I think yeah. that's, a, you know, that's evidence of a severe pathology. And yeah. like when do you step in? It's like a morbidly obese person. Do you mm -hmm. just allow themselves to consume until they die? Well, Joy, I think you gave the answer to your question, <laughs> right? Right in the first phrase and you said, I don't see how any rational person could sustain the economy that we've got. I don't either. But that's not the problem with it. There are very – let's put it this way. There are people out there who are capable 
of behaving rationally, but they're not being persuaded. <coughs> and I, I've actually been studying this. Uh, hold on just one second, Dan. I, I was I was listening to an ad. Not you know, as you know, I I have absolutely no contact with the mass media, but I do have to learn Spanish. So. When I'm driving down our access road and I'm not going to endanger anybody, I turn the car radio on and I listen to Spanish. Well, one day I accidentally got on the wrong channel and I was listening to an advertisement. And it was an advertisement for growing your hair. So it caught my attention. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it really hit me where I'm weakest. And uh, <laughs> at the end of the ad, uh, you know, it took me a while to realize that this wasn't going to work. And Got back to uh, Los, Las Canciones. But uh, at the end of the ad, the person said, scientific studies prove that this product works 50% better. Okay. Now, you know perfectly well that there were no scientific studies. And if there were, they would not prove anything. And 50% better doesn't make any sense if you wrote a sentence <laughs> like that on your paper. I would say, then what, man? <laughs> So the problem that I'm getting at is that we have been lied to so often at such a deep level that we no longer behave rationally. We are being – we, not in this class, of course – are being programmed to respond to signals, not to use our reason. And then you try and run a democracy on a bunch of people like that. It is not going to work very well. <laughs> we'll get that. Sid, and then we'll get back to you. I was just going to say about capitalism. Like a uh -huh. lot of the problem I found just reading Gandhi's stuff and like just trying to think about the way capitalism works is mm -hmm. the separation and the modes of production. Like that is yeah. the fundamental basis of capitalism. You have to take people away from the modes of production. And uh -huh. like it just seemed to go against like the idea of self sufficiency and yeah. swaraj and being able yeah. to like control yourself. Like Gandhi didn't even want doctors and lawyers yes. in his swaraj and that's like yeah. Yes. He was pretty extreme about self-sufficiency, but remember he was operating in a particular cultural environment. And there's this story about an American who came to him with some hanks of cotton that he had spun in America and presented them to Gandhi. And Gandhi said, you're bringing me this from America? This is the craziest idea I've ever heard of. So we may not have to be quite as extreme as he was in self-sufficiency and separation of production and so forth. But remember, he was trying to give shock therapy to a people who had been completely uh, hypnotized by this separation. Um, don't forget heart unity, though, and mutual cooperation. So now there's a wonderful documentary film that was made by the BBC, and E.F. Schumacher appears in that film and talks about Gandhi, Gandhi as an economist. And he says, um, you know, you don't have to have – you cannot – the fact is you cannot make wristwatches in a village. They have to be made in some kind of special facility. And they are useful. So you get into an arrangement where you send them carrots and they send you wristwatches. But you don't want to get into an arrangement like the one my, my son is working on right now in Nicaragua where these um, villagers – they're not peasants exactly – villagers, they harvest sea salt and they sell the salt to somebody for about 40 cordobas for a kilo or I don't know, maybe it's even 50 kilos or 100 kilos. I'm not – as I told you, I, I flunked – I left this economics course. So, <laughs> But they're selling it for a pittance and then it's being bottled and sold in upscale – uh, grocery stores, you know, like Whole Foods and Oliver's, for five dollars for an eight ounce bottle. That's that's where you don't want it to go. Um, so there is a certain amount of room for specialization, but what you don't want to bring in is the exploiting your capacity to do some to make a product that a person needs. You don't want to bring that in. And the way you, you block that is through the trusteeship route, getting people to look upon the tools of their production as trustees. Now, uh, there is actually in this world of ours 
at least one experiment. There probably are more of them now. Probably one experiment in capitalism with a human face. It sprang up in the Basque region of Spain. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of tensions and passions around that, but let me just use that term for now. The Basque region. And uh, they had a special kind of culture there which lent itself to this. And there was a, a priest named Father Arismendi who went around to bars at night and started talking to people about uh, their work in factories. And they organized uh, a kind of capitalism which actually avoids the things that you and I hate. And all people of goodwill must, of course, hate them from the bottom of their very good hearts. So. They have these factories and they try to democratize production such that, first of all, everybody <coughs> in the factory owns capital in that factory. If you're a poor person and you come in to work on a machine and you don't have any capital, part of your salary goes into your accumulating capital in the factory. So everybody has a stake. Okay? The, there is a strict limit on the difference between what the top managers will earn and the line workers earn. And you know, this is one of the things that's gone off the charts. You know, I think in Japan, where they're so much more productive than we are, I think it hovers around 20 times more. But in the US, you know, if you look at people like the head of Disney and things like that, it's like hundreds and hundreds of times more what the factory worker earns. Gandhi had a discussion with the Viceroy at one point where he showed him that he, the Viceroy, was earning 5,000 times more than the peasants over whom he was ruling. So they have a strict limit on that and they don't pretend that everybody is a good manager. You know, if I would go into a factory and say, I, you know, I have a PhD, I could be a good manager. And if they forget to ask me what my PhD is in, <coughs> namely comparative literature, and they give me the job, that factory will head south in a week. I mean, I couldn't manage a chicken run. I'm absolutely hopeless at it. But there are other people who are good managers. So you do let them manage and they do earn more money than the line workers. But they are elected positions. And every four years or five years, the factory gets together and they decide, you turned out not to be very good at this. We're going to put you back on the line. Or you're great. You know, continue what you're doing. So if you want to learn more about the Mondragon Cooperatives, and that's the name of the region in Spain, there's a fellow named Terry Molnar who's been working on this for decades. You can contact him through an interesting organization called the Social Venture Network, which tries to bring together successful entrepreneurs who have a green Okay. So I think, in fact, the Mondragon cooperatives were very successful. And at one point, although they are only territorially, population wise, I think they're like 3% of, quote, Spain, unquote, they, are, they were like 20, 25% of the economic product and the manufacturing in Spain. So, you know, they're very successful. And so I think this shows, if you care, and I don't. I think this shows that capitalism itself is not the problem. You could conceivably have a capitalist order which would not lead directly to the gross kinds of abuses that we're seeing. However, I, as I say, I have almost nothing to say about what kind of order economically we should have. Assumedly, if I'd stayed in that course at NYU, I would have something to say about it. But I tiptoed out before they discovered that I thought they were crazy. Okay. So let's see cover about 0.4% of what I was hoping to get through today. Anyone else have a comment though? Because this is much better than what I planned. Yeah. That's well, I just want to say, I mean, you basically made this point. So somebody was saying before that there is value to defend capitalism. Mm -hmm. Yes, myself, even though Gandhi used the term morality a lot, I don't use it. I think it's become kind of slippery and maybe not uh, helpful. But be that as it may, 
I think we would both agree on using this kind of vocabulary. If you can get greed out of the picture, you could run a capitalist system and it would be fine. Yeah. And for that matter, you could run a communist system and it would be fine. Although I just, I just wanted to – there's nothing irrational about it. So no. Agree with the motivation behind it. Right. No, I think that totally, – totally. I think his system was perfectly rational and perfectly defensible. It's, it's even utilitarian. But it does rely on a different concept of what a human being is. And all, even that can be tested scientifically. I mean, we got positive psychology has shown that human beings are fulfilled much more through service than they are through acquisition. So it was often said of Gandhi that he was one of those people who did not believe that there was a difference between what was going to work and what was going to be good. They would always end up being the same thing. So for my money, pardon the pun, <laughs> these are the three basic, basic principles underlying the Gandhian economic system. But uh, I'm not an economist. For that matter, Gandhi wasn't either. He was rather proud of the fact. But there are people who have looked over his system and they've come out with slightly different lists and I think I should share them with you just in the spirit of open-minded generosity. And these are from uh, a, a book by Gandhian Economics by Srimad Narayan. Pro I think his full name is Srimad Narayan Agarwal, which was published in 1970 at Navajivan Press. Navajivan both basically is in charge of the Gandhian literary legacy. Um, uh, and these are his four principles, which are a little bit different from mine. They're going to not be discordant, but you know, it's a different way of cutting it up. First, simplicity, which basically is the same thing as needs versus wants. So you're going to fulfill your needs. You're going to lead a materially simple life. And I think this is important to add that word materially simple because you can lead a life that is nuanced. Uh, rich in relationships, ideas, experiences, growth, all of those things, but be extremely simple materially. And that's where we've gotten confused in thinking that a cell phone is going to make me richer than I was. Um, and then, this is not going to be a big surprise, nonviolence. Well, do it my way. Nonviolence, and that would mean towards other people and that would include structural violence. So we're not going to have any exploitive systems. Um, back on the simplicity point just for a second, I read uh, the recent edition of Yes Magazine. I don't know if you're familiar with that magazine. It's very, very nice. Yes and Ode. They're actually tracking all of these Gandhian-like experiments going on all over the world and reporting on them. And the latest issue was about economics and localism. And they listed several instances of countries which like imported 24,000 tons of wheat in a certain year and exported 21,000 tons of wheat. Or <laughs> they would import, you know, 18,000 million gallon, gallons of something and export 16 or 24,000 gallons. Of, they're just not looking, you know, at what they're doing. Okay, um, so the second uh, – Agarwal quotes the Atlantic Charter which said that all the nations of the world – and you'll, you'll like this, uh, you'll like this one – all the nations of the world for realistic as well as spiritual reasons, those two being indistinguishable. All the nations of the world for realistic as well as spiritual reasons must come to the abandonment of the use of force. Now, this would include, of course, nonviolence toward the environment, towards creatures, as well as it would be structural or physical violence against other people. And the third important principle, which I haven't really brought into my list, was the dignity, sometimes he even said the sanctity of labor. 
So one of the uh, pr programs in constructive program, as you know, we talked this over, is bread labor. And one of the – I mean, there's a number of good things about bread labor. You remember what bread labor is. It means spending some time manufacturing one of the three basic needs or getting involved in one of the three basic needs or something like that, food, clothing, shelter. So for most Gandhians, it was kadi. You spent half hour, an hour a day spinning kadi. Uh, when Mr. Prasad was here a couple of weeks ago, I interviewed him and he talked about a Punjabi peasant who was a huge strapping person. Obviously, the guy needed at least 3,500, 4,000 calories a day just to keep walking around. And they brought him to a meeting. He never – doesn't like spending his time at meetings. They brought him to an all-day meeting. At the end of the meeting, they brought out some mangoes or something. And this guy ate two mangoes and he said, that's going to be enough for you. He said, I have not touched the plow today, so I will not eat. I mean, just, just a peasant, but he just he felt that you had to be involved in producing food before you had the right to consume it. So that was an important uh, principle and let's see. The the fourth one is kind of vague in this guy's list and I'm not entirely sure what he means by it, so I'll just give it to you. He says human values. I mean, hey, I've got human values. You've got human values. Let me read you what he says here. It seeks – Gandhian economics seeks a change in the standard values in which economics and ethics are no longer divorced. Thus, it is sinful to eat American wheat when my neighbor, the grain dealer, starves because he has no customers. Now, I'll give you a slightly different example of this. Uh, you know, I, I live near the town of Petaluma, which had a flourishing small business district in the middle of the town. Some of you have seen it. And it's collapsing now because these big multinationals are coming in. You know, and there's a pathetic story about somebody going into a local, I think a hardware store, person wanted four items. person found three of those items, brought them up to the counter, said, do you have the fourth item? And they said, no, we don't stock it, but I can order it for you. And the person said, oh, never mind, dumped all three items on the counter and walked out and said, I'll just get it at Target or Walmart or something like that. So I, I think that we would have to adjust or apply Gandhi's principles so that we would not do that. And, uh, and to, since I – since you're interested in my lifestyle here. We have a section of Petaluma which is in called – it's called an outlet mall. And the big, big manufacturers are there like Brooks Brothers. You can hear the Brooks Brothers in Petaluma, California. Most of the people are out there sh shoveling turkey manure all day long and they're going into Brooks Brothers to buy themselves coveralls. Anyway, uh, I made a vow when this outlet mall was built that I would never go in there. And basically there was only once when I had to break that vow because they had one product, obviously a, technolo a technology <laughs> device that I wanted <laughs> that I couldn't get elsewhere. But basically I, I just don't go there. And I don't care how weird people think I am. Okay. So simplicity, nonviolence, sanctity of labor and human values. Now I would also say, oh my gosh. We, oh, no, we've got it. Trusteeship is absolutely critical. All right, very good and enjoyed the discussion today. I'm going to try to cover uh, restorative justice and international conflict on Thursday. But if we don't get there, that's all right too. And next week will be for review.